It's a Friday Locked Up, Ask LOJ edition of Locked On Jazz. Can we narrow in and learn from the past to learn what the Jazz are going to do this year and what strategies should they take? It's next on a Friday edition of Locked On Jazz. Bum 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 pow. You are Locked On Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. How are you? I'm David Locke, radio voice of the Utah Jazz, Jazz NBA Insider. On today's edition of Locked On Jazz, we got a plethora of questions about the draft. Should the Jazz move up? Is there a player I've seen that you like in the top 10? Why do people call 22-year-olds old? What does it matter? Then Jazz roster building strategies of what they should do this year or not do and what their approach should be. And then we'll talk some playoffs and takeaways from that. Great questions, as always, on a Friday Locked on Jazz, Ask Locked on Jazz edition. I am David Locke, radio voice of the Utah Jazz, Jazz NBA insider, and this is Locked on Jazz. It's your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz, give you insight, expertise, Geeky numbers and hopefully making it way better to be a Jazz fan each and every day. Thanks so much for making Locked on Jazz your first listen of the day. We are free and available on all podcasting apps as well as on YouTube. So on your podcasting app, please follow on YouTube. Please subscribe for free and hit that bell button as well to let us know uh, that you uh, so we can let you know every time we post an episode. All right. Every now and then you start a show. And something's not clicking right in your brain. This is what happens when you do live shows. And so we're going to take two shots of espresso and see if I can turn myself on. Because right now, well, well, that's really weird. That was a sentence that didn't come out like you're supposed to. Because right now, it does not feel as though this is the normal uh, brain function that I should have. Uh, Maybe too many summer late night board games. We have both kids home and everyone's Having a great time playing. All right, let's get to it. Last year, the Jazz front offs drafted players with positional size and good three-point shooting. Is there any reason to think they'll deviate away from the plan? I thought this was kind of, hey, there, there are breadcrumbs out there, right? This is a great question. I think positional size is something that is, in fact, very important to this organization. Um, I think there's a there is a large belief in positional size. Which gets interesting in this draft, right? Because uh, Alex Saar, who's thought to be number one or two as positional size, and Zachary Rocher, who's now being talked about number one by ESPN, has positional size, and Nicola Topic, who is actually the Jazz pick in the latest mock draft. He's had some knee injuries. He's 18.9, 19 years old, and he's 6'7, 203. But then you get into some guys that don't have Reed Shepard doesn't have positional size, Rob Dillingham doesn't have positional size. Um, Isaiah Collier might not really have positional size at 6'2". Jared McCain and Devin Carter are borderline at 6'3". I mean, this is a little bit of the story of this draft is that you look at a player and there's a lot you like and then there's a big butt statement somewhere in it. And positional size has been part of it. And then if three-point shooting is a part of the equation and I'm going to go look at the spot up shooters. Then we're talking about Reed Shepard and Rob Dillingham, both of who I just mentioned don't have positional size. Cody Williams was a good catch and shoot guy last year. Dalton connect could shoot last year and has positional size. Um, and that's, that gets to be it. Jared McCain and Devin Carter, both were pretty good. So if this is a breadcrumb, that the Jazz drafted guys with positional size who were good three-point shooters, that's harder to come by. That J- Jacoby Walter might be there. He's he's kind of an average shooter. Not not terrible, um, but, you know, not Reed Shepard's 99th percentile, Rob Dillingham's 98th percentile, or Cody Williams' 95th percentile. It really, a little bit, by the way, brings Dalton Connect into the phrase more than we have talked about. That is not a high-end shot. He's a little older. And at 23 years old, and he's 6'5", so it's not great positional size. He's actually someone you'd really rather have be 6'8". So it's a great question and probably digs into the essence of why people refer to this as a not very good draft is because there's just not a lot of package players of that nature. 
Is it now? Co- By the way, Keontae was not a good shooter in college. He was thirty nine percent. So we probably should be a little careful with that. We we I think we played a bigger game there. Is it more likely the Jazz draft or trade for their next franchise player? So this is eventually. I'm going to guess it's the chances are we draft it, but then I don't know how we get there. If we're, it's a great question. At first, I thought this question when it came across was about next year. I was like, neither. I think it's going to be harder to trade for a franchise player than we're hoping. Um, I don't know who's the next one that's going to be available, right? Any idea that Luke is upset in Dallas is now over. I don't know if I think Carl Anthony Towns is a franchise player. I don't know if I think Trey Young is a franchise player. So I think the more likely scenario is that you draft, but then we got to draft in the top three somewhere along the way. What is your estimated percentage that we will draft all three picks, two picks, or one pick, or zero picks? Good question. I'm going to go with 0% we're taking all three picks. Actually, that's not true. So I don't think we want to take all three picks, but someone has to play along. I suspect the bottom two picks get moved together for a pick. So my guess would be there's a 65% chance we're going to take two picks. There's a 25% chance we're going to take one pick. And there's a... 65, 25, that's 10% chance we're going to take all three picks. And there's zero chance we'll walk without a player. So we'll take a pick. I think it's going to be two. Um, We shall see. But I do not, I do not expect it to be that we just take all three picks sitting where they are. In fact, I only think we'll take one pick, if I had to guess, of players that are in the position of the draft position that they're in right now. And that would be our 10th pick. What is your opinion is the Jazz greatest position of need? You know, this is hard. Lowry's, for two reasons, Lowry's versatility allows you kind of to play around with anything. So I'm going to kind of cop out on this and say talent. You know, the Ringer came out with its top 25 players under the age of 25, and we just didn't have one of those. And so... When we, when we didn't, when we don't have one of those players, that's what we need to have. We need to have a player who's got a real chance to be, you know, one of the young future players in this NBA. Like, you know, twenty-five on the list was Jabari Smith Jr. He's got a real chance to become a really nice player in Houston. I'm not sure we have that guy. Maybe Keontae has that upside if he puts it all together. Lowry, I think, you know, is peaking toward his, his or getting toward his peak. So it's it's going to be an interesting equation. So to me, we just need talent. Is there a greater position? I mean, I think we just need a bona fide big time scorer that would, who can go get a bucket, but that's a star. How important is old? Why? How important is age when judging a prospect? Some people say 22 years old is old. So there's a few things. One is obviously if you're 22, the chances of you developing to is, is less than if you're 19. So that's a lot of the scouting. The other thing is that when you're 22 and you're having success, you're having success against 18, 19, and 20-year-olds. And what you what I've been taught by Kevin Pelton is if you're going to do this, so let's take a player like Dalton Connect who started his career at Northern Colorado, then transferred to Tennessee. And uh, his first was in a junior college, his first two years. And so he's old. We just talked about he's 22, 20. You really have to go back and look at his performance at 18 against 18, 19 against 19, 20 against 20. Now he's unique because you just have his big sky 21, 22 year. And his first year, he's kind of okay. He shoots 50, 44% from the field and 36% from three. And then his next year, he's actually still, he's at now a senior and he goes 48 and 38. So we we just, you have to go back to his junior college years to be able to figure out how you look at him. Like Damian Lillard came into the draft and was somewhat older. But when you looked at him as a player, you could see in his 
early years when he was a freshman and sophomore in college that he was really, really good. Devin Carter went to South Carolina as a freshman. He only played 19 minutes a game, shot 42% and 27% from three. That's a little unnerving. He then goes to Providence in 43 and 29. And then his junior year is when he finally puts it together. So you, you get a little nervous as he's an older prospect that, <laughs> excuse me, he only starts to put it together until he's doing it at 22 against 19-year-olds. That's really the thing. I loved your draft valuation prospects so far. The Jazz might have a chance to trade up. Is there a player you think the Jazz should consider moving up for? So my numbers would tell you that Reed Shepard should, you should trade up for. Now, my brain tells me that you shouldn't trade up for anybody who's 6'2". But we've never had somebody who's in the 70th percentile in transition, 93rd percentile in the pick and roll, 100 percentile in spot up, 98th percentile in catch and shoot, 99th percentile in dribble off the bounce. Um, so my numbers would say you should trade up for him. He's he's the player in the draft for me. Um, and that that you have something incredibly special in that. Now, I also am very nervous about players that are 6'2". But I haven't watched him a ton, but that is certainly what the numbers say. It is a Friday edition of Locked on Jazz. We'll turn the focus a little bit more into uh, team building, big game hunting, and where the Jazz, who the Jazz can add to the roster as we continue here on today's edition of Locked on Jazz. Today's show is brought to you by Murdoch Hyundai, located at 4646 South State Street, also located in Logan and Linden. I'm currently driving... The Tucson, it's absolutely fabulous. Absolutely love it. Uh, we own two Santa Fe's and I bought an Ionic 5. So I'm not just telling you how much I like Murdoch Hyundai because they're an advertiser. It's actually true. That's what I keep buying and what I keep going with is because when I do the research, I see that I get the most bells, the most whistles, the most safety features, the most technology for the dollar. And I like the way the cars look and the we literally, a friend of mine was asking, well, what do you think? And I was like, well, we've had three of them and not had a problem yet. So that's the best endorsement I can give you. The, there, some of them are getting old and up near 100,000 miles, and we haven't had a problem yet on any of them. It's all at Murdoch Hyundai, located at 4646 South State Street, also located in Logan and Linden. If you're going to stop by, please email me first so that I can get you the VIP meeting you deserve as a locked on every day. Today's show is also brought to you by Prize Picks. PrizePicks.com slash locked on NBA for your first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks is easy and fun. It's why it's the number one daily fantasy app out there with more than 3 million members. You, most exciting way to play get into the action. You pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings. Roll in. Get in on all the playoff action with a chance to win 100 times your money as you, the world's best players take it to the NBA Finals coming up here. 100, you pick as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into 1000 You can do it with basketball. You can do it with hockey. All available on America's number one fantasy app right now. It's prize picks. Play a little WNBA prize picks if you want to. If you want to watch Caitlin, see what she's going to do. Prize picks. Offers weekly promotions, special offers, and biggest moments in sports. So go right now to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. Use the code locked on NBA for your first deposit match up to $100. Download the app. Use the code locked on NBA for your first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. It's prize picks. Thanks so much for making Locked On Jazz your first listen of the day. If you made the switch to Locked On Sports today yet, right now, one of the best football minds out there, Matt Williamson, is talking with Brian Peacock in the Peacock and Williamson show. They just finished their NFL draft, Locked On NFL draft show, so you can still get some great NFL content right now on Locked On Sports today. What else is coming up today? Do I have little notes? Usually, as I have, um, let's see. Um, I do not have any early sneaking notes um uh on that all right uh i'm sure we'll have wolves i'm sure we'll have mavericks i'm sure we'll have celtics a lot of coverage all right let's get to it you guys sending great questions let's take advantage um should the jazz avoid drafting a player at 10 with similar position skill to Keontae, or just go draft the best player regardless of position 
This one's tricky because the the right answer is just draft the best player available. But on the other end, if you draft someone who literally just does what Keontae does and needs those minutes, then you are stunting the growth of both of them. It, it's just, you can't lie about it. Like, it's cute. A lot of teams try it all the time. Memphis tried it with Kyle Lowry and Mike Conley a long time ago. Like, at some point, it just doesn't work. Now, here's what's interesting on Keontae. He's just big enough that I think he could play either the one or the two. Frankly, switching in the NBA is such that one through five is similar, or one through four is similar. The question on Keontae is actually, would he be better off if he played off the ball? Uses explosiveness, uses power to get to the rim. Maybe it helps his shooting a little bit. He does have that off the bounce three. You can bring him off and make him make some plays. Those, there, there might be an argument here that there actually isn't a defined, like Keontae, I don't know that I think Keontae is necessarily our point guard. So let's say, like, I don't know entirely what this means. But let's go back to what I just said. We trade up to take Reed Shepard in our future backwards, Reed Shepard and Keontae George. Okay, it's a little small. It's six two six five, but it might be really, really good. And so I think you just have to do that. And if there's a pure shooting guard, unless you've decided that Keontae just absolutely positively can't play the two or can't play the one, then he can slide over to the one. Sorry, it's he can't play the one. Which I still think is a real debate. I mean, the turnovers were at times horrific last year, but he was also 20. Could big game hunting include trying to pry a younger player from another club like Shingun? Yes, I actually think that is. But I think that unfortunately costs you Lowry. And so then I don't know what you're doing, right? Alfred Shingun is really, really good. Houston suddenly decides after he got hurt, they got better with the athletes they have. They're better off being open floor. They're going to trade Alfred Shingun and they need a place. But if they're going to do that, they're only doing it for Lowry marketing. And so is Lowry, Alfred Shingun that much better than Lowry marketing? I think that's, what you have to ask is like, yeah, you could probably go get a younger player, but I'm pretty certain it's costing you Lowry. As does this trade prospect that someone sent in here on this Ask LOJ edition. Would trading Lowry to Golden State for Pajemski, Moody, and Kaminga, plus a pick or two, make sense for us? So the Warriors then have to absolutely abandon any of their youth. So I don't think they would do this. And I don't know that I think we should either. Like, this is a cadre of players. I'm not sure I think that any of these players ever become a top 30 player in the NBA, which I think Lowry Markkinen probably is right now. Um, and so, you know, Moody's interesting. I know a lot of people in Golden State who actually like Moody an awful lot and really expected a lot out of him last year. Um, and those teams have been crowded, so you're not always sure. And, you know, he has some base numbers at 46% from the field and 36% from three that make you feel like that there could be another step for him. Kaming is a little, has been get, getting more time. And he's an awfully big body that's versatile. But I got to tell you, like his shoot, his shooting's a little troubling to me. I'm not, to be perfectly honest, I'm not totally sold on what I think Kaminga's next step. 6'8", 210 is awesome. That's, that's, Awesome. 68210 is awesome. And so that's interesting. Uh Pajemski's interesting because I think he put some context into this draft. And that is that Pajemski is 6'5. Like Reed Shepard, Rob Dillingham, some Dalton Connect. Some of these guys we're talking about all the time. You know, Pajemski seems like, oh, he's a surprise guy. Like he's totally positionally sized correct. He's 6'5, 205. And he was great. You know, and his second year at Santa Clara after the single year at Illinois was bonkers. Bonkers good. And now he's turned out to be that good. He's one that would, you know, you look at our numbers and Pajemski is one of those guys that makes you think that the numbers are, you would believe in the numbers if based on based on Pajemski. Um, so, you know, you also, Julian Strother also was out of the numbers. We'll see where he goes. I, I think that's the other play, by the way, is there's some player you wish you had drafted a year or two ago that you really liked and you just don't, you know, you don't have enough picks on the draft. You don't have the board that you can go get from someone right now. Like, is there someone on the bottom of someone's board, someone's rotation you really believe in right now? That that would be interesting to me. By the way, you know, I love my numbers, but it's funny. I was looking up Jaime Jaquez 
yesterday to see, like, should have I should have we known? 29th percentile transition percentage, not good. 79th percentile on isolation, great. F- rim percentage was fair. Pick and roll ball handling was interesting. 78th percentile. I mean, so that's that's getting that's pretty high end right there. So that that had him in kind of some elite category. Um, spot up percentage, though, he's in the 33rd percentile. Catch and shoot overall was in the 56th. And his off the bounce shooting was in the 45th. So there wasn't actually a lot there on Jaime Jaquez last year that made me, that in retrospect, we should have walked back and said like, oh, that's a guy we should have gone and got. Seems like both Dallas and Boston, to a lesser extent, Minnesota have a lot of two-way players. Who are the draft picks that seem balanced in that way? Am I wrong in thinking the Jazz have a lot of one-sided players? I really hope Taylor Hendricks will develop both ways. So Walker's a one-sided player, you're saying, because of defense, and John Collins is a one-sided player because of offense. Lowry Markin, I would say, is a two-sided player. It's just being really, really good. Um, Collins probably one, and Jordan are one-sided players because of offense. I get what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I think in the playoffs, if you don't do both, you're going to get exposed. So if you're not a two-way, if you're not a two-way player, and you're getting the playoffs, you know they're going to find you. Um, and that's going to, you know, it's going to be interesting. I mean, the key to the NBA Finals is going to be whether Derek Jones. And some of the and PJ Washington's guys can make shots because Boston's off second tier shooters are just much more pure and much better shooters. That when Tatum and Brown break you down and it swings out to Holiday or White or Pritchard or one of those guys, they're just much better shooters than PJ Washington, Derek Jones, you know, if Dante's playing. Who are the two way players in this draft? So, I mean, I think this gets into kind of the positional size issue. So from where we're drafting, Cody Williams would fit into it. Ron Holland is a beautiful body at 6'7", 206. I don't know that he's offensively got the skills. Um, Jacoby Walter might turn out to be a two-way player, though I was not convinced with him defensively. I saw him standing up a lot. Honestly, that's a great question, and that's hard to tell right now. The collegiate game is so crowded. It's hard to tell who's going to come and play. Defense. Like, frankly, Bub Carrington out of pit was really interesting to me in this regard. I thought he played really hard, did both things, and thought he was really skilled. And then, you know, transition percentile is a disaster, and there's some things in him that jump out that go the wrong way. Does John Collins have positive trade value? Would he be able to help the Jazz move up if they wanted to? We'll touch on that next as we continue on a Locked on Jazz edition here on the Friday edition of your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Does John Collins have positive trade value? Would he be able to help the Jazz to move up if they wanted? So, first of all, if he's you're, if he's moving up, the chances are you've got to take back the same amount of money. So that's that's the one thing on. When you're talking about John Collins trade value, I think what you have to realize is the question is, does John Collins have enough value that somebody else is willing to bring back John Collins's contract, which is 26.5 million next year and 26.5 million the next year. And it's a player option. So it really mainly have one year left. And frankly, that's not that much money that it's interesting how, John Collins feels like it's gone from a bad contract to a good contract as things have increased to grow in the league, but 30 million a year for a starter is fine. John Collins had another kind of really good year, right? He got his points per game up over 15, shot 61% on twos, his three-point shooting return to 37%. Yeah, I got to believe this guy's got trade value. He was really good last year. And his contract, which at one point seemed like it was an albatross around your neck, is not that big a deal anymore. So do I think John Collins has trade value? Yes. Do I think he has trade value to move up? What gets tricky about there is like, are you moving up like to three in Houston to go get Reed Shepard? Well, then they have to send you back $26 million and they don't they don't have it. Like you can't, I don't think they have a salary situation. <laughs> in which you can send John Collins and the 10th pick to Houston for the third pick. 
if that makes sense, because of the way the cap works. They, they're not just sitting there with $26 million of space. Detroit probably has that room for space right now. They might be the one who could do it, um, but I don't know that they want John. Like I'm not sure that John Collins matches their timeline. So finding someone which matches their timeline and has it then gets more difficult. So trading John Collins is difficult. Does he have trade value? I think yes. Talking about the playoff scars, what can it do to a franchise? How do you think Minnesota will rebound from the scar? So my theory on this is that we talk all the time about, we, we still kind of believe in the whole Chicago plays or Boston plays, what was it? Detroit plays Boston, beats them a bunch of times, loses to them a bunch of times, fights through it and wins. And then Chicago plays Detroit a bunch of times and loses and fights through it and wins. And we believe that that's the model by which you build a champion. And I don't think that's true anymore. Um, the Celtics could get close here if they do it, because the Celtics will have knocked on the door a few times and then broken through if they win the championship. So this will they'll, they'll go back a little bit to the storyline where you'll look at them and say, okay, well, they lost in the finals in 21-22, and then they lost in the Eastern Conference finals in 22-23, and that propelled them to win the finals. We'll, we'll tell that story again. Eh, I don't really buy it. Um, and, you know, because... And they've been, you know, with Tatum, they've been doing this for a little while. They lost in the Eastern Conference Finals in 1910, in 1920. So they've just been really, really good and held it together. What I do think happens is you lose one of these playoff series, it gets fairly, it's emotional, and it starts to lead to, you know, problems, scars, and some of them heal and some of them don't. And Minnesota, to me, is liable to be a team that doesn't repair the scars. Oklahoma City probably should repair the scars for a little while, but we'll see how long that lasts. But we have something interesting going on here, and that is we have these two teams that everyone is absolutely assured will be great again. And I, I, I'm i not totally assured of that. Like, they were the two best teams, no question, in the um, regular season. And, you know, they... And so, yes, you believe that Minnesota and Oklahoma City with their young players should be right around the corner again. Let's see. Uh, Sacramento's another one. Let's see how they re rebound from their scars because that was a big scar this year. Can Markkinen right now be the second or third best player on a finals team? What's our path to get there, those players? If not, how old will Markkinen be by the time we have them? All right, well, let's just look at these two rosters. Lowry Markkinen would be the third best player on Dallas, I think, right? Behind Kyrie and Luca, right? And Lowry would be the third or fourth best player on Boston, right? Tatum, Brown, Przingis went healthy. I don't know how much you want to love Drew Holiday. I think Lowry's better than Drew Holiday, but Drew Holiday is really good. And Derek White's really good. They're really good. I mean, when Boston gets Przingis back for the finals, they got five players in the top 50 in the NBA starting. That's They got to be the favorites. Is Demonis Sabonis the model for contract for Lowry Markin? A four-year, $186 million that was, I think, almost always guaranteed. There was about $10 million. So... so if you look at Sabonis and you want to look at it year to year and look at it that way and have a better understanding of it for the Jazz um, and for Lowry, it's 41 next year, 45 the year after that, 48 the year after that, and 51 the year after that. It, let's see. How do you say, is it, should we expect, um, all right, let's go with this. Lowry's agent is starting here. Jazz would probably like that to be a little less and maybe less increasing to keep some flexibility for the future. Because it's mandatory that we have this question every single week. Why are the Jazz not embracing the San Antonio model? If San Antonio pulls it off again next year, I think they'll be set for the decade and Jazz will be practicing mid-season tank. This is the question of why the Jazz don't fully tank. But I don't know that, like, this is the year that, like, you should be. That, doesn't that, like, didn't what happened in the lottery, like, hurt this argument a little bit? Right? Atlanta is the number one pick. Washington got two. Houston got three from Brooklyn. 
San Antonio is four and Detroit is five. Like, I'm not sure that the full tank with the way the lottery odds are showing to be worth it. And the midseason tank is not getting us top three or four players. There may not have been a top three or four player this year. Next year, where there seem to be three or four really good players, will be interesting to see whether you see tank again. Would you rather be bad one more year and get a potential top five pick next year or semi-competitive next year and potentially make the playoffs and show Lowry you're serious about winning? Well, if we've signed Lowry to the extension, then I think you can deal with Lowry being serious about winning, but you also have a little bit more leeway there that he understands the plan. Um, I'm a little, I don't know how to get out of this box. I'm a little concerned about just making moves to look as though you're going to be more competitive when the fact is you really have only moved yourself to 9, 10, or 11 in the in the West, in which case then it does feel, I'm not, don't disagree, not disagreeing, that it's better off to like just develop talent and play. Might be that Lowry, Market, and Will Hardy are too good and you can't lose enough games. Um, but it does feel like the lift to get us enough talent to be able to go compete to the six, seven level of the Western conference feels like a big lift right now. And maybe one we have to wait a year or two to get to. Do teams like Phoenix Clippers show you can trade too much depth in order to trade two star level players to compete for a title? I, I think there's, I think there's a lot of argument right now and discussion that Denver Phoenix and Milwaukee more than the Clippers just didn't have enough depth to survive in the playoffs. And the theory always was, well, that will hurt you in the regular season, but it won't hurt you in the playoffs. So I think that's a really, really interesting. Feels like the jazz, the Mavs could shock the Celtics. She feels like the Mavs could shock the Celtics here. Who you got? I kind of always have Luca. I just am such a believer as you guys know but I might have to go Celtics here. Their talent is just too good. All right. And then you guys discuss amongst yourselves on the YouTube chat room. Thank you for wrapping up the whole show. I'll leave you guys for this. Throw it up on Reddit. Which jazz player would thrive the most in today's NBA? Let me throw a caveat on this because I'd love to hear your discussion. Throw it up on our jazz, on the subreddit jazz also and talk about it. Um, maybe I will. Uh, which jazz player would thrive not only the most in the NBA today. So like we're pro that's discussing our greatest players of all time. But what about... What older jazz player would thrive more today than they did then? Like, would Thurl be better today than he was then? Would Daryl Griffith in his three-point shooting be way better today than he was then? Let me ask you that question. Have you guys discussed it over the weekend? We'll be back with you Monday. More draft talk, more of the rest of all of it. Right now, if you're with us on Locked on Sports on YouTube. We'll send you the Locked on Sports today, the first ever 24-7 national sports channel. Check it out on YouTube and Amazon Fire. Have a wonderful weekend.